Hey guys, uh, sorry I haven't posted in a while. I have, uh, I'm excited to say that my wife and I have just had our first child and so it's been a month of kind of getting readjusted to that and uh, trying to just get into a new rhythm. But I'm excited to be uh, recording today. I'm excited to have time to uh, sit down and uh, continue our study into 1 Samuel. So today we're going to be picking up where we left off in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And this is a beautiful passage. Uh, whenever we're getting ready to teach this, it's important to first emphasize that this is a Hebrew song. Uh, it's going to be Hannah's song is how a lot of like our study Bibles will have it labeled. And when we look at that, we need to remember that... Um, this is written in a different language, and so if you have any kids who speak, um, are, are bilingual, or are familiar with other languages, this might be a time to kind of show them or talk about how songs don't translate as easily. Um, I used, uh, I, I was in sign language for many years, I worked with the deaf ministry occasionally, and I know one of the hardest things to learn to translate is songs, because you don't only want to articulate the um, the meaning, but you also want to articulate the flow and the meter that comes along with it. And that's what's missed a lot um, as we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 2 uh, with Hannah's song. Uh, it's not put to meter. You can find examples of people trying to sing it, but it seems a little clumsy. I'm definitely not singing it for you today. But I do think it's important to show this to your kids, um, and you can actually um, recommend, show there's some YouTube videos of that if you really want to get into that. But as we look at it, what's important to emphasize is that Hannah is having a time of worship. She's worshiping God because God has blessed her. He has blessed her with this child, Samuel, and then he's gone on to bless her with five or more children. We're going to speak about that here in just a second. But it's a, it's a beautiful song. We'll start off reading the first, uh, the first verse in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. So we need to ask the question, why is Hannah rejoicing? She's rejoicing because God has given her a son. What is Hannah rejoicing in? She's not rejoicing in that son. She's not rejoicing in the uh, just in the fact that Samuel is there, but she's rejoicing in that God has met her needs. And we need to remember that. Uh, a lot of times whenever we are blessed, whenever God answers one of our prayers, our, our propensity might be to find joy in that blessing, but we need to make sure that we're finding joy, that we're worshiping the God, not the blessings that God has given us. Actually, so then we go into verse two. There is none as holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. We see here that Hannah then goes on to recognize the uniqueness of who our God is. That God met her needs specifically. That God met her, and, and she calls him her rock. That there's none like him. That God is an amazing, unique God, and she's worshiping that. You know, this is something that I think we have lost in modern uh, Christianity is that we don't write or worship songs. Uh, and I, we have a few people in our church, uh, one young lady, her name's Lamore, and she writes some just beautiful songs um, about God. And she uses those in worship. She sings them in song specials. And I am always so incredibly blessed hearing her sing those songs. And I have no doubt that uh, our, our congregation is blessed by that. And I always want to encourage our young people. Um, you know, if, if if God does something for you, worship him. Worship him in poetry. Worship him in song. Worship him in praise. Um, you know, someone had to write Amazing Grace. Someone had to write, um, you know, all these songs that we sing. Why couldn't some of our young people write these songs, write a new song, sing a new song to the Lord. And that's what Hannah did. She sat down and she wrote this song. Um, obviously, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you know, our songs today can be spirit-filled, led, and God wants us to worship him and have that unique worship experience. So uh, whenever I'm teaching through this, I always want to encourage people, you know, if that's not part of your daily routine, isn't part of your, your worship experience, make an effort to, to worship God in song. Um, my friend Joe, he does these beautiful poems. I love watching his poems on uh, YouTube. And they, uh, they're they very raw, they're very real, but they're um, 
They, they speak of God and his goodness. So then we continue into verse three. Talk no more exceedingly proud. Let not arro arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken and they stumbled and girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread and they that were hungry ceased so that the barren hath borne seven and she that hath made children is waxed feeble so think about hannah's perspective here we already talked about some of the issues between paniah and uh hannah and how paniah had judged her and was her adversary and now god is saying or hannah is saying look God has blessed me. He carried me through that. He's given me seven children. Now, this is something I always want to point out to our kids. I always try to show these um, apparent contradictions in scripture because I think it's important because a lot of times these are the things that our kids will be faced with or, you know, adults can be faced with where someone atheist or will grab one thing and say, look at this apparent contradiction. And we have a responsibility when we find those to not just glaze over them. I think it's really important for us as teachers to shine a light on it and say, look, there is an answer for this. And teach our kids that whenever they find an apparent contradiction, whenever they find something that that, they, that muscle's already trained to go, okay, let's look at this. Why is that there? Look with me up to 1 Samuel 20 and 21. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife. And said, The Lord give thee seed of the woman, this woman, for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And when they went out of their own home, and the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Okay, so look at what we just read there. So we just read in uh, verse 5, so that the barren hath born seven. And then we look here just later in the same chapter and Hannah says, or, or we see the account that Hannah has born three sons and two daughters and Samuel. So there's a couple different ways that we can read that. One, we can read that she has born three sons and a fourth in Samuel and the two daughters. Or we can read that she's born three sons, one of those is Samuel and two daughters. Either way, this... Um, doesn't equal seven. Like four plus two or three plus one plus two doesn't equal seven. Four or three plus two doesn't equal seven. Um, I only went to Bible college, didn't get a lot of math there, but I know well enough to know that those don't equal seven. So what's the explanation here? Well, remember what we said, this is poetry. This is Hannah's song. She's writing this song. So there's a couple explanations. One, she could just be using, uh, I'm not a big numerology guy, but she could be using the number of seven to represent, represent the perfect amount. It could represent many. It could represent God has given me the exact amount of children that I'm supposed to have. She might've been writing this uh, song um, in the midst of this. And so she doesn't know how many children God is going to give her, but he's given her the appropriate amount. Um, so that's one explanation. The other explanation that I've heard is that God has given her the three sons and Samuel and the two daughters. And it's possible that Sam, that Hannah would have lost one of, of her children, had a miscarriage or had um, a, a, a stillbirth or um, even just lost a child at a very young age. And as far as the, the, as far as the historical or the, um, the, the account would be concerned, that child wouldn't have counted. But any mother who's gone through that, any parent who's gone through that can tell you that that child counts. Um, and, and so for Hannah, it wouldn't have mattered whether the history books would have recorded that she had had this child. Hannah knows that she had this child and that definitely would have counted for her. So I don't know which is the, the proper way to um, interpret that. But I do think it's important to recognize like, okay, there are things like this in the scripture and there are explanations for why that it says seven in one place and five or six in another. But like I said, it's a poem. It may have just been that that's the number that like rhymed best as she was writing it and the Holy Spirit led her that way. I, I don't know the, the reason Hannah chose to do that, but the important thing is, is that there was a reason for it. So, we continue and we see in verse 6 that the Lord killeth and maketh alive. 
He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He hath raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted beggar from the dunghill and set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of earth are the Lord's and they hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of the saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, but the strengths shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces, out of the heaven shall the thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. So as we're going into this, it's really cool. That we see Hannah is starts off by praising God for what he has done for her. And then she praises God for who he is. And then she praises God for how God brought her through her experience. And then we see that Hannah kind of goes and expands her worship. She goes from focusing on God meeting her need with Samuel to then she goes, And look, he can conquer death. He can conquer poverty. He can con he, He's created the pillars of the earth. He is, um, gives direction of his saints. He directs kings and nations. Wow. Think about that. Hannah takes this truth that she got a hold of. God answered my prayer for Samuel. And because I saw God work there, he can now, she, she finds comfort in saying, and I know God can work in our nations and God works in all these different ways. And she knows God better and she's able to worship him more um, appropriately and she worships these attributes of God and the capabilities of God and who he is why because of God meeting her need with Samuel I think this is amazing and I think that this is one of the coolest things that we can teach as teachers is talking about how important it is for us to have sincere worship of God and how when we see God work in one area of our life, it's easier to see God work in other areas of our life and expect God to work in other areas of our life. I use a lot of personal examples here. I'm sure if you're teaching, you have examples of things that you can say, God's worked in this area. You know, I prayed for this. And the important thing is, and what I tell my kids is, okay, the only way you get to have this relationship with God, the only way you get to have this type of deep worship is by having that prayer life, by having that these requests that I've made known unto God. Some of the coolest things I've seen have been answers to prayer from God. And I love being able to look through my prayer journals and going back and seeing where God has worked in my life. And I can point back um, and say, oh, God worked there. God did this. God did that. And I use some personal examples here. So emphasizing that and saying you need to have a sincere prayer life with God and write these requests down. And the more times you see God answer prayer requests, the more times you see God do these amazing what may seem little things, but whenever you see God work, you go, wow, God really came through there. God really did this for me. And it makes your walk with God more sincere. It helps your worship to be more sincere. It helps the hymns that we sing to come alive. It helps the worship that we have to be real. And seeing God answer those prayers is one of the most real ways that you can experience God. You know, that's one of the things that I encourage my kids. You know, a lot of them struggle. They say, well, why haven't I seen God work? Or I don't know if God's real. Well, you know, I can give them uh, apologetic answers. And I think there's a place for apologetics. But for a lot of these kids, I just ask them, what's your prayer life like? Have you been praying? Have you been asking for God to do anything in your life? Because if you're not seeing him, maybe because you're not looking for him, you're not trusting him in any areas. And so I encourage them, step out by faith, tell them, take God to the test, pray for him, or pray for him to answer needs in your life and see what he does. And I think that that's one of the most important things that we can encourage our uh, young people and our churches to do today is to be um, vibrant men and women of prayer. Well, guys, that wraps up for Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I hope you've enjoyed looking at Hannah's song here. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If this is your first time to the channel, let me invite you to like and subscribe. I try to release videos about once a week um, talking about how to teach the Bible and giving commentary on the Word of God. So I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Hope you have a great day and God bless.